Today I'm down on the California coast with Volvo taking a look at the first ever EX90. And not only did they bring out cars for us to look at and play with, they also brought car parts for us to take a look at. And these are the sort of thing you probably won't see at your dealership when you go ahead and take a look. So let's go and dive deeper underneath the skin of the EX90. There were three major categories that stood out to me and that's power, entertainment, and safety. But I wanna start on the entertainment front because in theory, that's the most fun. And when it comes to an in-car entertainment experience, well, the bar has certainly been rising year over year. With so many new cars having very large screens, there has to be something that differentiates this experience. And one of the directions Volvo has gone is for your sound. Now the EX90 is according to Volvo and based on our testing, the quietest Volvo they have ever built. And the interior cabin volume is very, very low. Meaning that you just get so much more out of any speaker system you put in that vehicle that it almost makes sense that this is sort of a point where you can put a better speaker system in because it doesn't necessarily feel like it's wasted. And that's a conversation I had with the folks at Bowers & Wilkins who do put together the upgraded sound system that you'll find in the X90. And that's going to be a 25 speaker system with, I think, the standout piece, which is sort of that marquee center channel, which is not only providing a center channel, but also a unique visual element that maybe not everyone loves, but does go really, really well with this Volvo interior. Now, Volvo is taking advantage of this and their partnership with Bowers & Wilkins, making sure that their system is top notch. Not only is it a very good quality system as far as the components go, but it's also going to be using a lot of software. That's going to be your 3D spatial audio, your Dolby Atmos sound. And one of the things they're adding, not immediately, but Q2 2025, at least that's currently how it's scheduled, is going to be the ability to change a lot more tone and range in this system from that driver screen. If you're someone who likes to make minor changes to the treble and bass and go about your way, no problem, you can do so and still very much enjoy your music. But if you wanna go a little bit deeper and really change the feel of this sound, this Abbey Road update is going to be definitely one to look forward to. Now, Abbey Road is a recording studio, and even within this update, you're gonna be able to change essentially where you're positioned. Are you gonna be in the studio? Are you gonna be using newer equipment or older equipment? Or are you the one at the soundboard who's making all those changes like the producer would? And that way you can listen to all of these tunes, either exactly how they were supposed to sound, how they would have sounded 20, 30 years ago, or how they would sound today. And this is a great way to take advantage of a really heavy software system to make sure that that experience is one that you enjoy. The next feature that doesn't seem to be active during launch is going to be the LiDAR system. And this is the safety component because this car, like just about everything else on the road, especially in this price and size category, has a significant number of sensors, cameras, radar, all of these built in and using a very comprehensive computing system to increase the safety of the vehicle. It'll give you things like adaptive cruise control, blind spot monitoring, 3D cameras, all of these things that you would come to expect from a current technology heavy car. But the LiDAR system is the first mainstream mass-produced LiDAR system in any vehicle. And again, unfortunately, it's not gonna be active when this vehicle is released. I expect it's gonna be running in the background and gathering a lot of data, a lot of miles on the road, but it's gonna be a little bit longer until it's actually up and active. But the question is why have a LiDAR system in the vehicle? Number one, it's visually really obvious that it's there. And car manufacturers have done a lot of work to make sure that the radar systems are hidden in their vehicles. Normally you find it in the bumper, behind either the shield, the logo, whatever it is, or a black piece of plastic to make sure it doesn't stand out. But a LiDAR is a lot harder to do because it's a much bigger unit. And in this case, it looks sort of like a little baby beluga hump. Though with the color palette the Volvo has, I do think it's blended pretty well. The fact of the matter is it stands out. The simplest difference between radar and LiDAR is that LiDAR is gonna be able to see better in the dark than radar does, which is when it's going to be the least safe to drive and when we would need those systems the most. During the day, it's also gonna be active and functioning and seeing things differently or confirming things that radar sees. Either way, this system is meant to make it safer, especially at night. And what we had here on display is going to be the same LiDAR unit that you have in the vehicle, but stationary. And what it was doing is overlooking a golf course. And what we could do in a very cool setup is put on a virtual reality headset and see real time exactly what that LiDAR was seeing. And it's the computer generated image of, but we can watch golfers moving around on the course. We can see differences in terrain and all of that's going to be exactly what the car is taking in and processing and remembering that this is going to be basically what we see at night as well. And you, the driver are not going to be seen well anywhere near as well as this system. 
And not only is this incredibly fascinating, it's great to see a significant improvement in some of the safety capabilities. I just wish this was going to be active when you first bought the car, because again, there's no hard deadline or set date on when this is going to start being functional. The last category is power, and I'm gonna break it up into two separate sections. That's gonna be vehicle power, as in onboard power, and power output, meaning how much horsepower. And when you buy this vehicle, at least at the moment, there are gonna be two different powertrain configurations. There is a twin motor or a twin motor performance. The difference there being about 100 horsepower. It's 408 horsepower for the twin motor, it's 510 horsepower, for the twin motor performance. And that's not a huge gap. But one of the most interesting pieces here is that both of those are using the exact same front motor and it's the different motor that gets either tuned up or tuned down. And that means with the twin motor performance, you have a rear wheel drive bias system, which is what a lot of people are looking for in a performance driving vehicle. But what we get in the twin motor is going to be a front wheel drive bias system. It's not unusual for a vehicle this size and configuration to either be front wheel drive or a front wheel drive biased all wheel drive system. But with electric motors, we can stick the motors essentially wherever we want and in whatever configuration which is why we see most manufacturers making the rear motor larger because of that performance dynamic that most people are looking for. That's why it's a little unusual here that we have a front wheel drive bias. And when I asked Volvo, they had a couple different reasons for doing so. Number one is the fact that the rear motor is obviously in this case going to be less powerful. And they wanted to use the more powerful motor more often than the smaller, less powerful motor. Volvo is using a disconnect, so only one motor is operational and the other is as removed from the system as possible, meaning we're also not getting drag from that motor because free spinning isn't entirely what they do. Now we've seen this in a lot of other electric vehicles, but what we have generally seen is that they're using the smaller motor more often than they're using the large motor. So in this configuration, it would actually mean that if we use the small motor, it's rear wheel drive. But when I asked Volvo, they said the reason they wanted to use that bigger motor is because with a smaller motor, you tend to have to turn on the second motor more often, and that's actually gonna make the system less efficient. And it makes sense because we're looking at a pretty large SUV, and if we're not having as much power, then there's obviously gonna be a need for more, more often. The other thing that we get with a front wheel drive by a system is that as far as traction goes, it's going to be a little bit better, generally speaking. And it means that when you're regenerative braking, there's a slightly higher potential for more regeneration. And the fact that we're using the larger motor means that more of that regeneration is gonna happen without engaging that other motor at all. The last piece has to do with power on board and what we're able to do with it. And Volvo is giving us a 111 kilowatt hour battery with 107 usable. Now, the first thing I ask is why is there such a small amount kept in reserve? And this is something that we've seen on a lot of manufacturers is that everybody has a slightly different way they wanna balance this battery. Some manufacturers take a much bigger percentage of battery in reserve. And generally speaking, that's been for battery health. But we've got a lot more data about battery health and it does seem that people and manufacturers are more confident in the fact that these batteries are gonna last a long time and may not need to be as protected. One of the big advantages of getting a very small buffer means you get more of what you pay for. If Volvo puts a 111 kilowatt hour battery in your car, that's what you've paid for. And so the fact that you can only use 107 of it means that you're a little bit limited. But if you wanna use your vehicle for more than your day-to-day -day driving or your road trip, you wanna use it as a backup home battery, or you wanna use it as power generation, depending on, well, your utility rates, you can do that, I think, a little bit more effectively because you're getting more of what you pay for. Volvo has made that integration just that much easier by partnering with DC Bell in selling an all-in-one unit that can be purchased at the same time as your EX90. And this unit is going to be, like I said, an all-in-one. It's going to be an inverter for your power coming in from your car, it's also gonna be able to take in something like solar panels, and it's also going to be able to output. And one of the unique things about its output is that it's DC output, not AC. So we're not getting the same kind of losses, and we're able to charge this vehicle a little bit faster. Let's start with charging, and for this particular unit, that means a 25 kilowatt output. That means that you at home are essentially more than doubling the max charge rate at home of every other vehicle on the market. There are gonna be very few that are an exception, but they're not gonna be able to do this much power. And that's because we're not using AC level two charging, we're using DC to DC. So whatever the vehicle is able to find up to its max limit, you're gonna be able to do. And the max limit here for the EX90 is 250 kilowatts. 
So even though we're only coming in at 10% of its total capacity, that 10% is still gonna be, like I said, more than double just about every other car on the road. There are gonna be very few instances where you ever, ever, ever need 25 kilowatts of at-home charging. And the good news about this unit is that you can go ahead and split that 25 kilowatt output to two 12 and a half kilowatt outputs, meaning you can charge both of your electric vehicles still faster than most cars can charge at home. And that's two different units. If you're planning on getting solar or you already have it, you're gonna be able to integrate that into this unit and use it as the inverter, meaning that whatever power is coming through the panels can go basically directly to your car. You are not likely to get 25 kilowatts directly to the car, but because it's DC to DC, we're go ahead and bypassing one of those conversions, meaning we're limiting our losses. And you can also set your car to charge during those, well, off peak or peak hours, depending on how you wanna look at it, so that you're maximizing your energy consumption in a renewable way. The other thing you're able to do with this setup is go ahead and sell power back. So you can leave your vehicle plugged in, and if it's in the evening or in the early morning or during the day, and there are peak charge rates, you can go ahead and sell your power back. Where I live, that's not a very practical solution, but where a lot of these vehicles are going to be purchased, it is, so it's nice to know that you have that option. And again, just a little bit more flexibility with a partnered unit that makes a lot of sense. Now, the other thing that's going to be missing, at least for the moment, is that the EX90 doesn't have the new NACS or J3400 connector. It's still using a CCS port, and that's what's gonna come with this DC Bell unit. But if you go ahead and upgrade your vehicle to a vehicle with NACS or J3400, you can go ahead and simply swap out the cables from the inverter unit, and that way you don't have to buy a whole new system. And this is one of those things that we see that's a little bit more difficult with an in-home unit. So for example, General Motors has their Ultium, and you can buy an Ultium charger, you can buy an Ultium home energy, all of that is CCS. The question is, what's it gonna look like when things convert over? Is there gonna be a easy swap cable, or is it gonna look like a whole new system? And those are things we don't know because it's built for the Equinox, the Silverado EV, the Blazer, it's a built-in ecosystem. But DC Bell is partnering with Volvo, so this system should be a little bit more agnostic to whatever the particular manufacturer is, but it also means there might be a few more hiccups. If you have excess power, you don't have to sell it back. Obviously, you can use it for yourself, and you may want to during those peak hours so you're not paying more expensive electricity costs, or if the power runs out, obviously you have well, many, many, many days of available power. You're able to pull 16 kilowatts from this unit, and that means you should be able to power just about every home in the United States, obviously not all at once. And if you have something like a hot tub or a big pool, you may have to shut those off, but those seem like exceptions that are pretty easy to manage. This has been a deeper dive into some of the cool new features of the Volvo EX90. Let me know what your favorite is down in the comment section. If you wanna see our full review on the EX90, I'll have that link below as well. If you have any other thoughts, questions, comments, or concerns, let me know. And until next time, we'll see you down the road.